How many times in your life have you prayed the Lord's Prayer? My guess is that at St Paul's there would be people who have prayed this prayer more than 10,000 times, maybe much more. Maybe some people have prayed it 40,000 times. It's quite conceivable. And it just makes you think, what does it do to a person to pray this prayer that many times? We know that repetition lays down and reinforces neural pathways in our brain. So what sort of neural pathways are we reinforcing by praying this prayer so many times? Do you remember those Colgate ads um, where Mrs. Marsh has a piece of chalk that's been sitting in ink and she picks it up and breaks it in two and someone, one of the kids will say, oh, it really does get in. It's the same with the Lord's Prayer. It does get in. And what is it that gets in? Let's have a look at just a few of the things that get in. Well, the first thing is how it starts. It invites us to call God Father. Now I know that most of us have experienced more or less inadequate fathering, partly because so many of our fathers and grandfathers had been traumatised by war service. So we need to look at what Jesus meant by the word Father, not what we have experienced necessarily. God is revealed as Father in the Jewish scriptures, especially in the book of Hosea, which we've also read a little bit of today. This book pictures God's relationship with Israel in terms of a terribly messed up family. Now, it's, it's really quite a disturbing passage, this um, first chapter of Hosea, and, and I did think about leaving it out, but, um, but family trauma is a reality of life for so many people. And the Bible, like so many other things, the Bible just refuses to sweep it under the carpet. Now, if you listen carefully to that passage being read from Hosea 1, you may be horrified to see these innocent children burdened with such awful and inauspicious names. But isn't that what happens in families? The things one generation tries to hide are just brought right out there into the light by the next generation. Families have always been like that. Hosea uses shocking imagery to show us that God has been willing to come so close to our messy humanity as to experience all of the grief and turbulence of a very troubled family. Sometimes in Hosea, God is pictured as a marriage partner with an unfaithful spouse and sometimes as a parent with a rebellious child. But God is consistently pictured as that one faithful, loving family member who's just constantly tearing their hair out, trying to work out how to keep this family together. Hosea 11 which we'll get to next week, expresses God's broken heart in a way that every parent can identify with. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called them, the more they went from me. When we begin our prayers with our Father, we are claiming all that fierce, faithful, compassionate love. And we are saying that we are willing to accept the obligations associated with being God's children. In the culture of Jesus' day, children 
always learned the trade of their parents. They watched their parents work, then they gradually learned to do what their parents did. So when I call God Father, I am presenting myself to God as an apprentice. We talked a little bit about that last week, uh, and so if you like, you can go back and have a look at, at the sermon on discipleship. We can observe Jesus, who showed us what God does when working within the limits of humanity, and what we see him doing, we do. Also, by calling God our Father, we're making other bonds, our biological family bonds in particular, but all of those things that obligate us, we are making all those bonds just a little bit looser. In that society where absolute obedience was demanded from children, even adult children, those who pray this prayer are saying that obedience to people and institutions has limits. I will obey God first, human authorities second. In our time, we think less about obedience and more about inherited personality traits. People today worry that they might be destined to turn out just like their father. But we look to God as our father. And our true destiny is to grow up to be just like God. And we say, hallowed be your name. Now this has been a tough one for Christians over the years. We, we like to use God's name for all sorts of unholy causes. We go out into the world with our own agendas, our own visions, our own politics, and we use God's name to give ourselves legitimacy. God's name has been used at times to justify empire, slavery, patriarchy, just to name a few. God's name has been dragged through the mud by Christian people in almost every generation, including ours. But if we want God's name kept holy, we will not use God's name for our own agendas. Instead, we will pray, your kingdom come. Now I could preach every Sunday for the rest of my life about what that means. Um, and in fact, that's what I intend to do. Every sermon should call us to attend to some facet of God's kingdom. Forgiveness, freedom, the defeat of evil, the presence of God, and so on and so on. We maybe find the word kingdom a little bit difficult in our culture. We love democracy, but we are all kingdom builders, all of us. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are facing the question, whose kingdom am I building? Is it my kingdom? Am I devoting myself to getting myself all the things that will make me strong and secure? Or maybe I'm building someone else's kingdom. I've caught myself doing that a few times in my life, and it always ends badly. That, that is the danger with charismatic leaders. We all love them, don't we? But when someone presents a wonderful vision of the future and they seem to have just what it takes to get us there, we are all in danger. We throw ourselves behind that vision and it's not until we are hurt and disillusioned and burnt out that we realize, but hang on a minute, that wasn't God's kingdom wasn't even my kingdom. It was some other dude's kingdom. And nobody's kingdom is worth my sweat or my tears or my sleepless nights. Only God's kingdom is worth that much. And so I pray every day, your kingdom come. Not mine, not somebody else's, only God's kingdom. And the thing is, in between when Jesus taught the disciples this prayer and when the prayer was written into our Bibles, God's kingdom did come. It has already happened. 
It came in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so when we pray that God's kingdom will continue to come and extend from that little band of disciples to the entire cosmos, we have to ask ourselves, if God's kingdom came decisively through humiliation and suffering and death, can we expect it to be extended through popularity and success and prosperity? When we pray, your kingdom come, we are signing up to pick up our crosses and follow Jesus on his path of humiliation and suffering. And that is a path that the Anglican Church finds itself on at the moment. We have been diminished. We have been shamed. We find ourselves without power and without money and without respect. This is a hard, dark place. But we were wrong ever to cling to power. We were wrong ever to cling to money. We were wrong ever to cling to respect. In this dark place, we have been called to let go of all of those wrong things and learn again to pray, your kingdom come. Not my kingdom, not the kingdom we call the Anglican Church, God's kingdom, only God's kingdom. And so our vision of God's kingdom is going to shape what we ask for when we ask for our daily bread. And you might be expecting me to say we shouldn't pray for parking spaces or for money to pay our bills, but it's not that simple. God is our Father, and our Father wants us to be honest about our needs and desires. Maybe you need money. Should you ask God for it? Or will you hide that need because it isn't spiritual enough? What does it say about your relationship with God if you hide things? Better to bring that need into the light of God's love. And in the light of God's love, you might find the courage to take a little peek at what lies beneath your sense of a need for money. Let's say it's a desire to be independent and not be a burden on others. Well, that is not a trivial need. That's definitely a need we should take to our Father in prayer. And what might be beneath that need? Well, maybe, just maybe, you feel that you're not worthy of being cared for. And when we get to that realisation, something very important happens. That, in that deeper space, that is where we find communion with all humanity. As you see, you're not the only person who undervalues yourself. Most people in this world have no idea of the enormous value and dignity that they have simply because they're human beings made in the image of God. So as I pray for the daily bread of, of money, I'm called also to pray for the daily bread of human dignity. And I can ask that for myself and for people immediately around me. But then I can expand my imagination to include people in situations I cannot imagine. In war zones and prisons and refugee camps. In violent repressive countries and workplaces and homes. People who literally have no daily bread. And then because I've made that connection first, I no longer pray for them in a patronising way as if they were foreign to me, because I've been honest with God about my own needs. I know that we all sit around the same table, asking the same Father for the same bread. And as we come to the Lord's table to receive the bread of Christ's body, we bring those people with us in our imaginations, asking that they will also receive bread from our common Father. And around that table, we are all welcome through the grace and compassion of God. There can be no 
withholding of forgiveness from each other. We ask God to forgive us and God does forgive us freely and from there ripples of grace flow in ever widening circles. Grace changes the world not just as each individual experiences God's forgiveness but as each of us chooses to pass on that forgiveness to everyone around us we forgive others as we have been forgiven. We express that each Sunday as we pray, as we say to each other, peace be with you. That doesn't just mean that I want you to experience God's peace. It also means that as far as I'm concerned, you and I are at peace. All is forgiven. A commitment to forgive does not mean that we ignore the awful power of evil in the world, but it does remind us that our enemy is not flesh and blood. When people get co-opted by evil, they become its victims just as much as the ones they hurt. We are called to face the faceless powers of destruction in our world, to name them. And in the version of the Lord's Prayer that we pray each week, we ask our Father to save us from them to save us all from them. And we can do that with confidence because good and evil are not equal and opposite forces, eternally battling for control. Compared with the power of God, evil is just a shadow. Its days are numbered because the kingdom, the power and, a, and the glory don't belong to it. They belong to God our Father. Amen.